everyone. Thanks for watching. We're dialing in with Steve Goody today. He's a property coach uh, based in Wellington, but works with everyone around New Zealand. Uh, thanks, Steve, for dialing in. We're just going to have a chat today about what you're seeing in the investor market. So a couple of weeks ago, we had the LVR restrictions. We're going to start right on the, the topic that everyone wants to talk about. Yep. Uh, now, I'm assuming it all worked out and the investors all left the market. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. just, just like banning foreign buyers uh, yeah. overnight. Um, yeah, in reality, um, did anybody notice that the LVR restriction got removed? It's a funny thing, isn't it? That it's it, it really, I mean, it, it was forecast to come in and the banks implemented it straight away and we almost got more investors coming in um, because they remembered that they could buy again, you know, those ones who were on the verge uh, remembered and, and came back in. So what, what did you see as a result of that? Well, I didn't really see anybody running out there and getting an 80% loan to buy an investment property. I think that the um, reserve banks restrictions are one thing, but the bank's ability and willingness to lend money is a whole separate issue to, again. And, and banks were being tighter than the reserve bank for a period there. And so it just shook the market up and everybody was talking about it, but nobody was doing anything. Everybody just stuck it and did their own thing. But the biggest problem, obviously, was if you had a small portfolio of four or five Auckland houses for the last five years, did you have an equity problem? <laughs> Come on, you know, your values have gone up 50%, 60 80% in that time. So you, you can afford to pay deposits. Uh, I'm sorry, but that's just not the fix. That and, and, and that's the thing, right? If you need 40% deposit, let's say you've got all $1 million properties. If you've got four of them, they only need to go up by 10% each to get that 40% deposit for your next one. And the next one only needs to go up by 8%. So it's, uh, yeah, it, was, it wasn't the solve. Now, to be fair to the Reserve Bank, they only estimated a 3 to 4% drop off in buyers. They didn't think it was the fix all. But I think the kind of media grabbed onto it like it was going to be the, the silver bullet, right? Yeah. So, so my, my counter cyclic position, if you like, is... When are the risk rules and restrictions going to come in to protect the fair, honest, humble property investor from the first home buyers? Why <laughs> is it that we have to babysit um, these millennial first home? No, I'm gonna I'm gonna just annoy everybody now. No, I, I mean realistically though, I, I understand the rhetoric, but can you specifically target one group of buyers and rate them higher than another? Yeah, well, so, I, I I think I think they're if you're working on sort of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, they're talking about getting everyone into their own house. But at the end of the day, yeah, I, I think it is a bit unfair to uh, to to really target these people to take them out of the market. Um, I, I wonder what the alternative is, right? So so they know that the the housing inflation can't continue at. 18 to 27 percent depending on where you are in the country uh, and that's what they were trying to solve uh, and they're trying to solve it in a way that's faster than um, yeah we're going to build a hundred thousand houses because that takes more than the flick of a switch right yeah but the government claimed that they could build a hundred thousand houses and they've built about 80 so they're, they're only in, in all fairness and support of the government they're only about 400 years behind that's now right. having said that they've thrown in extra restrictions that stop developers, and I know developers building 100 houses this year, and I know guys building 1,000 houses this year, and, and they've thrown extra roadblocks in place of those people. And the general market, and when I say the general market, people who, who make comments on Herald and Stuff.co on Facebook, they, they, they look at those developers driving around in their jets and their private planes and stuff, and, and, and they, they just go crazy. Oh, but somebody's making a living out of this. I'm saying, well, yeah, but this guy just helped the market buy 100 houses this year. And what did you do? You're still living in your house. You haven't rented it out. You haven't donated it to somebody. They're actually fixing the problem. And so I, I've got a few ideas what's going to fix this market. Um, my first idea is that, A, nothing will fix it. It's a free open market economy and it will fix itself and it will probably take about 50 odd years. It won't be in my lifetime because it's taken that long to get us to this point. Additionally, I think if the government was really serious about fixing it, they should take GST off the price of new builds and take GST off the price of new build materials and promote and allow people to rebuild new houses faster. And a lot of people will look at me as a developer and say, oh, that's, that's self-effacing, you know, that helps you out. I also think they should double rates. 
I, I'm, in, I'm in this my house here and I pay about two and a half thousand dollars a year in rates. I'd be happy to pay five thousand dollars a year in rates on all of my houses if they used it to free up more land. <laughs> I was just going to say, if it's used in a productive way. <laughs> Absolutely. I don't need a new swimming pool complex. I don't need more parks. I need them to do higher density in, in, in the areas where it's where it serves the purpose. And that's, that's the only thing that's going to do it is more houses. Yeah. And I think higher density is a thing that people of New Zealand are going to have to get used to, right? The Australians are kind of used to it. They build these brick houses, one up against each other, cookie cutter, bam, 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 down the road. And, and Kiwis really stick on to this kind of, I'm not living in less than 700 square metre kind of really? section. And, yeah. and, and um, well, yeah. right, yeah, yeah. Other people can, but I'm just not going to. And, and that's if everyone says that, then uh, then that's an issue. But I And, and you're starting to see it in the, the likes of kind of Albany and Auckland and things where these, these rows of houses, and look, they're, they're not the most beautiful, but people get houses, whether it's investors or first-home buyers, um, people are getting roofs over their head. Developers can build them reasonably cheap and they sell them reasonably cheap because they they only want to make, you know, they, they want to sell their house. Um, but I think we're going to have to really change a mindset, which again, won't happen in by 2022, uh, but maybe where we're heading, you know, the new generation coming up um, may just find it acceptable to live in an 80 square meter, 70 square meter townhouse um, yeah. Well, why wouldn't they? It's probably double glazed. It's probably warm. It's dry. It's clean. It's tidy. There's no massive backyard to take care of. Nobody in the next generation wants to live in a house that makes a Dunedin student flat look good. Um, yeah. But they want these clean, dry, new places that are commutable from where they are. And, and you touched on it with Australia too. Like w when I was um, holidaying in Brisbane as a kid, you drive for 45 minutes to get to the Gold Coast. And now it's all urban center, urban center. Because what, what happened is they went, oh, we've got this projection that says we're going to have this population that's going to be living in, in Queensland. And so we'll put a train system and a sewer system out there and let the developers go crazy. And that's yeah. what they did. They, they were ahead of the curve. And mm. we've been behind that curve for 20 or 30 years. Mm. Um, 1919, the first housing court New Zealand property was built in New Zealand. It was in Miramar, still there. It's a museum now. And... <laughs> They have been building those housing corp houses for a hundred years. And has it fixed the problem? No. <laughs> Not um, according to the data. <laughs> so, so you're an investor, right? Obviously. Mm. And so am I. What's going to stop us from buying more rental properties? It's gonna, it would, it's it would have to be. Yeah. 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 And yeah. there's so many houses that the rents stay the same or drop down a little bit. And it's not affordable for us to do so. We're not making money out of it. That's the only thing that's going to stop people from doing it. And you're talking about this sort of free economic decision then, right? Like it's it's, it's your economic decision to no longer be in the market. And that's where, and, and Wellington's done it. Wellington did it in, well, when was the last time it stagnated? Probably well, 2008 to 2016. Um, it, it just got to a point where everyone said, I'm no longer happy to pay those prices. Seven years later, it became the norm and everyone got excited again. It had become the new norm. Um, people's incomes had gone up a little bit and kind of interest rates had come down. And, and that was the market, right? It, it, nothing stopped it. It just stopped. And Auckland did the same thing. In the last 12 months, it's boomed off its nut. But, I mean, let's be fair, for the four years before that, it was kind of stagnant. And yep. so 50% of the boom that Auckland's just seen is a catch-up. Um, the rest of it is ridiculous. Um, mm. But ridiculous is the new normal. <laughs> Absolutely. Getting used to every price having a decimal place in it. Yeah. yeah. Price should be next. What did you? We were talking. You were talking a bit a little bit earlier about sort of the double glazing that new builds brings in. What did you think of the um, new requirements for um, healthier homes uh, put on landlords? Did you think that was overly onerous or? No, um, it made much difference yeah. to me. Happy know. tenants, right? Happy tenants. Were, healthy tenants. Funnily enough, you're going to love this, but it was self-serving for me as well because a lot of my actual properties are boarding houses and I pay the power cost there. So I'd already <laughs> paid the insulation because I'm paying for them to be heated inside the yeah. property. So it was cost-effective for me to do so. I've just bought three new heat pumps today for some, some rentals and to sort a few things out before winter comes along. I mean, I, I don't particularly consider that I have any tenants at all. I have clients and I like to keep my clients happy. And they come back and they, you know, they stick around. Um, and I feel some social responsibility, obviously, to them as well. Um, I love when my clients leave my business and go and buy their own property. I think that's a great move. Um, I've got clients that have been in my properties for 10, 12 plus years as well. Um, 
I kind of like with my hold properties to set them up so that they're sustainable for a very long period of time, um, renovate them once, do it really properly, um, not have to go back for a long period of time, make them bulletproof. But um, I, I think the healthy homes thing was a minimum standard. And if you had stuff that was well below that, then you should probably have a bit of a closer look at yourself anyway. Well, as someone who uh, rented student flats in his student years in Wellington, <laughs> I was very for them because uh, some of those houses are horrendous, right, and, and yeah. really required a, a makeover. So it's um, yeah. yeah, but that's an aging population, uh, an aging population of property stock in the marketplace too, which is why we need the higher density. We need high rises and stuff. I mean, I've I've um, worked very hard and very long for many years on building high rise developments, and um, I can tell you how hard it is and how expensive it is. It is absolutely insanely expensive. Um, I know a lot of developers now who won't go over four floors. Um, they won't. They don't want to do anything with structural steel or anything with a lift shaft in it. Um, just because of the cost of it, and it's just in, the insanity of it. Um, and that's, Are you talking around earthquake strengthening or just load bearing over four, four story kind of stuff? So you go to your QS and you say, look, I'm building 167 apartments. I'm going to go nine stories high over 2,000 square meters of land, 100% site coverage. You do a drill test into the ground to see if there's going to be liquefaction, see how deep your piles need to be. That drill test costs you $80,000. Mm. And the results of that drill test tell you how deep your piles have to be and how much steel has to be in them. So you figure out exactly how much steel there has to be. And then it goes on the quote, it goes plus or minus 200. And I said, well, 200 what? 200 dollars, 200,000? No, plus or minus 200%. That's as accurate as they got. Right. And that's because of the fluctuation in steel cost, because it does fluctuate. It, it, you know, if, if you, <laughs> If you want to really, really worry about something, worry about steel cost. If you want a relaxing time by cryptocurrency, it's just yeah. about. It's, <laughs> um, and then they give you the world's worst quote. And it says it might cost this much or it might not. Um, and then you've got to fund it. So you've got to then go out into the marketplace and find $19 million. Um, additionally, if you're doing high rise, one of the things that most people don't kind of realize is if you're building 160 apartments, you have to finish all 160 before you get paid for the first one. If you build 160 townhouses on lower density, you can finish five and sell them and then start the next five and then have the next five with the foundation down. You can stage it, yeah. It's just so much cheaper. Yeah. So there's no real great incentive and cost and return to actually go high anymore, which is creating this density issue that we're having. So every single time somebody like myself goes and buys a big piece of great central dirt and then doesn't use it at its highest density, that you've created a problem around that for the next 100 years or until the, uh, the end of the life of the property. Have any companies solved that? I mean, I can't, I can't think off the top of my head what the solution, because you've also got to pre-sell 70% of them uh, normally, right? Like No, normally 100%. So. Right. The percentage they use on pre-sales isn't the percentage of the size of the building. It's the percentage of the dollar value of the lend. So mm. if you're building a $19 million building, you usually have to pre-sell $19 million worth of property. You can't sell any two of those to one investor. Um, there's a whole pile of rules around it. Um, as a developer, you would have to dig into, um, oh, I've sold this property to Bob and Bob can afford it because he owns these other properties and he's got a job and it's COVID proof. You basically have to do the broking work for each individual person before you sell it to them, or it might not be considered a pre-sale. And they've obviously got to be arm's length transactions. So I can't, I can't sell six of them to my cat. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's, it's just very, very hard and it makes townhouses look easier. So if you go one or two floors high and just stuff the density of the entire area, it's, mm -hmm. it's cheaper and easier and more cost effective. Yeah. Yeah. It's a shame, isn't it? Because uh, if stock is to be solved, then it needs to go vertical. But um, yeah. well, it kind of does. I mean, 22 townhouses were came on the market just down the road from here, here last week, and they sold in four hours. Right. Uh, I mean, Thirty or forty thousand dollars above the asking price, um, which most people who bought them considered quite reasonable. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, brilliant. Okay. Yeah. Hey. So interest rates. What are you telling people, um, you know, I heard a great quote this morning. I was, I yep. read Principles. I can't remember who, who has, um, who wrote it, but I'm, I'm reading it at the moment. And, uh, and his quote was, those who live by the crystal ball are 
doomed to chew broken glass. And I thought that was great because uh, the number of bits of broken glass that I've chewed from my erroneous crystal ball gazing has been great. So based on that, what have you got? In there? <laughs> Yo, um, I love a good crystal ball, but I'm... I'm, I also think that after 25 years in the property market, holding more, you know millions of dollars worth of mortgages, I'm quite realistic. And I first started borrowing money at seven percent, and it went up to nine percent, and I was freaking out. Ah, cash flow terrible. And so um, when interest rates come down to 2.2 percent, where they sort of are now, I'm looking at it going. They've gone from nine to 2.2 in 10 years. Are they liable to go to minus six, which is the dip, you know nine yeah. two point two minus six? Um, they're just not going to. I think that we have largely bottomed out. Um, we're at a 0.25% um, OCR, and all of the Reserve Bank's comments around the OCR are that we've bounced back from the COVID ex experience better than expected. Um, at the moment, property is propping that up, most definitely, and so is um, fiscal policy from the government and monetary policy from the Reserve Bank, i.e. printing money and flushing the economy with additional cash, which is obviously, um, you know, it's cocaine for assets, let's be fair. And so property values have gone up. Um, what hasn't really shot up as fast as property values is rents. And so what smart investors have done is they've gone, oh, my 4.5% interest rate's going down to 2.5%, um, but I'll keep repaying at a 4.5% level and we'll get rid of some debt. Um, a lot of smart investors have done that instead of just having 100 bucks a week extra in the bank account. Um, I think interest rates will start to come up again. I don't think it'll happen until the very end of this year. And when they do, I think it'll be very, very gentle because unless some other industries in New Zealand start pumping along the way property has, property is the golden child and they don't want to kill the goose. Um, I can't see them wanting to adjust or tweak or change that too quickly. There's a number of things, right? There's business confidence with global COVID still going on. They want to keep that ability to borrow for your business going on, uh, which is why they're looking at debt to income ratios and LBRs to sort of slow down the finance, but not raise interest rates. I think I think you're absolutely right. I think people should be aiming uh, and you don't have to do it today, but aiming for the ability to pay their mortgage at seven or eight uh, percent. Or eight. I think I think you've got to stress test your portfolio. You've mm -hmm. got to look at it and go, have I got some stuff that's only just cash flow positive and stuff that's really cash flow positive, and how comfortable am I with that? I, I think you've got to expect that in the next couple of years your interest rates will go up two and a half, maybe three percent max. Um, I don't think you've got to go as hard as six or seven percent. I think that's. Um, a little bit of a false economy, but we're also looking at the difference between how much you're borrowing the money at and how much you're renting the property at. So you've got to look at your yields. You've got to look at taking care of your tenants slash clients and your properties and getting the best rent you can out of them because that buffer between what interest you're paying and what yield you're returning, that's your profit margin and that's your buffer. That's your comfort being able to sleep at night. Yeah, I mean, I use 7% as kind of a stretch goal. Anyone who's paying it off at, as though it was 5% is doing really well. And in the next few years, by the time it reaches 5%, will have paid down a significant amount of their mortgage and will therefore be in a better position. But I think what people are missing is that it, they, they say that interest rates go up, you know, interest rates could go up by 2%, um, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it's double, right? Like 2.2% to 4.4 is double and if you're if you're stretched at 2.5 ish and your interest doubles then there's there's going to be some problems so you kind of work towards doesn't have to be today doesn't have to be in the next six months work towards getting the ability to pay something down at for starters, your personal mortgage, any, any non-tax deductible mortgage uh, at, at that sort of higher rate, then the next five years doesn't matter and you can concentrate on investing, not on <clears throat> being worried about what interest rates are going to do, right? Does that sound sort yes. of... Yes, but, and the big but there, I suppose, is that, not, that interest rates as part of the great scheme of property investment, if you like, doesn't actually happen in a vacuum. And so if interest rates go up 2%, it'll probably be a heavily weighted inflationary pressure on rents as well. And you will find that actually, that actually rents start to lift at the same time that interest rates do. Um, 
you know, you, you've got the property values, you've got your mortgage, you've got your interest rates, you've got the rent you're receiving, the yield you've got, nothing in there spikes on its own. It goes in waves and this carries that along and this makes that change. And we saw this in 07, 08 as well. We're getting interest rates. Um, the Reserve Bank was using interest rates to try and cool the market down. And we got up to sort of 9% um, fixed rates and things. And uh, that was the last peak, I suppose. And, and um, me as a new-ish investor on at that in, in, in the early 2000s, um, I'm freaking out a bit. And my, my parents are saying to me, you know, we bought a section for $7,000 as our first investment and we were paying 22% interest rates, you know? It's like the old pat on the head, oh, son. Yeah, <laughs> you have no idea. <laughs> and, and we didn't. And um, But I think that the only people that really need to not worry but be wary of, of their position is people that are asleep at the wheel and people that don't maybe contact their mortgage broker for an assessment of where their, where their interest rates are sitting and where their lending is and people who aren't basically concentrating and keeping an eye on it and people who have stretched themselves very recently. And if you've stretched yourself very recently to get a big loan on a new house and it's your first home or you're an entry-level investor, there is one global great big fantastic fix for that and I can give it to you right now and it's super, super easy. Cool. Fix for five years. Yep. It's under 3%. The interest, the, the average interest rate in New Zealand over the last 30 years has been 7.25%. If you can fix it under 3% for five years, you'll be wrong for two years and you'll be right for three years after that. For that that's that five-year gap. And, and you'll look amazing later on to your mates. Just right now, <laughs> you'll be looking like a, a little bit of a nana. And we can live with that because here for a long time. You know, that's, that's the trick. Yeah, more and more are choosing that five-year rate. I mean, we went through a stage of really excited um, five-year lock-ins at when it hit 4.99%. Um, just kind of anecdotally, that seemed to be the amount that everyone was really stoked to get the five-year rate. I think about that one bank that offered the 10-year rate, I think it was, for fixed, and there may be some regrets in there. But you're talking 2.99%. And as you say, mortgage rates are never going to be negative. So you've got a bottom line of what it can be. So we know we're pretty close to it. So, uh, yeah, I, I think, I, I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of um, sort of breaking your mortgage into a couple of chunks, um, yeah. some like some like half on one one year and some and half on five years and, and some prefer three kind of chunks. But but yeah, having a bit of that means no interest rate shock. It never comes off 2.29 next year to 4.5. You've always got a little bit coming off. And I think that's just a part of dealing with your um, risk mitigation when you're an investor. Absolutely. And, and it depends on how big your portfolio is and one thing or another. And realistically, the smaller the portfolio, the more risk you, you show, the bigger the lending you've got. If you've got quite a few million dollars across quite a few banks, you've actually got quite a lot less risk as well. Um, yeah, you know, a, lot of, a lot of investors do get stuck in that one bank risk model where they've got absolutely all of their equity and all of their lending and all of their banking with one bank and they can't sort of pull that away. And when um, the Reserve Bank and the government's mucking around with fiscal policy the way they are, um, it, it's, it's dangerous. And, you know, you really need to be spread across a few, a few different areas. Yeah, I, I'm not sure you're going to agree with my strategy on this, but this, this is what the discussion's for. My, my general rule is that I give a bank a million dollars of lending. And after that, well, it's, so it's not a house, but generally a million dollars, because it, after a million dollars, you don't tend to get any better service or better rates or anything. Not well, <laughs> quite. Um, but below that, you know, you're kind of still small fry, like uh, everyone's kind of got it. I don't want to, you know, minimize anyone's debt position, but kind of most people have a $600,000 debt these days if they've got a house. So I tend to do a million and then look on the next house at another at another bank um, because you're maximizing the benefit of that bank um, and its debt. And, and the banks are wise to it these days. They're given sort of an additional 0.1% or just been a little bit pricklier if you're only giving them the investment property. But yeah, that, that's that's generally where we sit, which is probably similar in, in terms of you would give a couple of securities and then move to the next bank, right? Would that be your... Yeah, if, if at all possible. You know, sometimes you just don't get that choice. Um, and, and as you say, you know, banks give out, um, you know, freebies and a little bit of interest off here and there. But, you know, let's be realistic. You're talking about, you know, 
a, a sliver of a percentage point, which means very, very little over the length of a loan. Um, the, the one thing that most people uh, think is um, important in lending is getting the best price possible. And I don't necessarily agree with that. I think what's more important is being able to borrow more money continuously and always having a redraw facility and having a good relationship with your bank and being in good standing with them. And basically, um, deal of the century pops up. You can rip, whip down to your bank and you can have the money with them in a day or two. Um, I think that's way more important than you know a sliver of a percent here and there that means very little over the long period of time. Yeah, isn't that funny? So the difference, you know, if this bank's pay, you've got to pay 0.1% more, but they will allow you to buy a $600,000 property, which will grow at 7% on average per year. You'd pay 0.1% of that uh, additional all day long, right? Yeah, well, it's 7% average on year, year on year, obviously, yes. But um, the, the trick to it is, is twofold. The trick is right now, people are getting $5,000 capital gain per average property. And so if you were pretty smart a few years ago and bought five more properties than somebody with an identical position who wasn't quite as uh, up to it, if you like, you're now earning $25,000 a week extra in capital gain. This isn't just me pulling numbers out of the old back pocket either. This is uh, a bank account... <laughs> And why am I referring to bank economists as being, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> a legitimate source. <laughs> bank economist article came out during the week saying that the um, average gain in capital per property at the moment uh, a few years ago was $1,800 a week and now it's $5,000 a week. So five extra properties, $25,000 a week better off. Mm. If you're <laughs> at the end of your investing career and you've got reverse mortgages and you're living on that equity, that's a lot of money. That's a huge amount of money. Um, and, the, and the difference is just being set up properly and actually, you know, dealing with experts and getting the right advice. Mm. Hey, let's talk about um, buying to renovate. Are you seeing much? I know, I know you do it. You do it very well. You've got a good team. What about the average kind of uh, punter who's first or second investor? Is, is it a game that that non-professionals can get into, do you think? Or is you it? Is it, um, it? I mean, I... I fairly famously many, many years ago was buying, renovating, and then on selling uh, up to 200 properties a year, which means that I had to finish one about every nine days. So I was doing four or five uh, at once with a big team of people. Um, if I'd kept half of those, then um, you'd be my backdrop would be my private island now. Um, the real money is in buy and hold, absolutely. Problem with buy and hold is you run out of money, you run out of ability to borrow, and it's a bit slow. And if you can buy, renovate, and hold, or buy, renovate, and sell, you know, there's obviously much better cash flow in that than just trying to buy one house every year or two. Um, don't get me wrong, I love all strategies, and all strategies tend to, over the long period, get you to the desired result. But I just think that having more than one or two or five strategies is uh, far superior. I still like buy, renovate. But it's starting to get killed by the heat of the market at the moment. I, I, I queried a couple of weeks ago in one of my videos on my page that um, is the act of buying a secondhand house dead for current investors and is buying new builds, buying off the plans, buying you know portional ownership even, uh, is that the new investing that we're going to see coming forward? And it might mm. be for the next year or so. I mean, if you can uh, make $5,000 a week by doing nothing, then you You've got to make a lot of money by renovating, right, to make that. Uh, yeah. Um, there's so much heat in the market at the moment, though, that you can do nothing without renovating. Mm. Um, you can literally, and I've, I've done this this week, you can literally buy a house and then sell it again the next day for $70,000 more and yep. just walk away. But, you know, that's six to eight months every 10 years. You've got to time the heck out of that. Um, yeah. It's always a good time to buy and hold long term. Yeah. Um, and it's nearly always a good time to buy and renovate. And I think it is now. But if I can go down the street here and buy um, a three bedroom villa that needs, um, you know, three months worth of work to make it profitable, uh, and that's going to cost me 850 grand, and I actually have to settle it, and I have to have $100,000 renovation capital in there to make my 50 or $100,000 profit, why wouldn't I just go and buy an $850,000 three bedroom new build in a popular area? Um, that's not going to be built for 12 months and that's worth 950 by the time I settle it. Mm, yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that that act of sort of buying to flick on immediately 
Um, it's okay if you've got a large portfolio and you're, you're offset by other long-term assets, but it's a game of musical chairs because at some point the music's going to stop and you're going to be left holding something that you didn't plan to hold. And as someone who that happened to in 2008, <laughs> but we've all got those stories, right? So uh, yeah, as someone who that who was buying and selling madly and in 2008 hit and really hard to get rid of it for three or four months um, in a world where a week was was um, enough to sell a property. So um, yeah, but you just got to have that kind of uh, offset. Um, yeah, I mean, I, the way I trade, I don't take any risk on the properties. I don't go unconditional on them until I've found an on-sell, that type of thing. And I've got a lot of protectionisms in place there. But I do I do agree with you that every layman thinks that he can do that. Um, and it's not necessarily the truth. And in reality, most people think they can buy a house and renovate it in three weekends for 20 grand. And that's also not true. Um, it's nearly always financially better off to get a project manager and a crew of guys in rather than do it yourself. Um, as somebody who's coached maybe a thousand people in property trading what i find is even the people that are really good at it they get to nine or ten or twelve houses a year and they just burnt out they couldn't stand going back down to resina might have 10 again and and they and they've lost their enthusiasm and they're they they you know they push for it um and you're much better off just to hire somebody who can um quote you the entire renovation go and do it walk out you know come back throw me the keys in two weeks and i'll put it on the market or or place a tenant in the property um it's just, yeah, you, you otherwise you end up with our hairstyle, don't you? Yeah, that's you know? right. Yeah, <laughs> that's how I got to be like this. <laughs> I'd rather relax. I really would, you know. And, um, you know, it's claimable. You get better quality work. It's it's just too easy. Um, mm. what, what I do see, and, you know, you commented on the property trading and the renovating, is what I see is new, newbie investors make some really good money in the first strategy they find. And they go, wow, that worked. And they rush out there to try and find more of those. And so you're basically out there looking at, in a, you're out there in a forest looking for a tree, but you only want one particular tree. And, and I like the idea of having 10 or 12 different strategies that I've known and used and can bring out of the toolkit. And then I go into the forest just looking for the nearest tree. Yeah. And if, it's, if you find a decent property, you can then allocate the strategy to it. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah. yeah, but that's where you need a coach, right? So, like, that's where you need someone to sort of walk you through, or at least an experienced person to talk you through some experience and what's gone wrong. Yes and no. Um, I am a property coach, and that's how I make my living. And I literally think that barely anybody needs a property coach. Um, <laughs> I know worst um, upsell ever. <laughs> yeah. no, but, no, but really, let, let, let's get it out here. You know, most people will do quite nicely and they'll buy five or 10 properties and they'll live in one and they'll live off the rent of the other five and they won't need the super and they'll be able to go on some holidays. Mm -hmm. And that's great. And that's fantastic. And it's a slow way to get rich because the fast ways to get rich are always a, also a fast way to go the other way. And, yeah. and I can't stand that. But I like the idea that most professional athletes have a coach um, most mortgage brokers get more education and go back into the marketplace and, and learn more skills. And I just think that it's, it's safer and it's faster. It's just, mm. just as simple as that. Nobody needs it, but if you want to do this thing at sort of like a slightly higher game, then find somebody that you connect with and understand who works the strategy that you want to be working. I mean, I'm, I, I'm no better at this than anybody watching this, this recording. I'm, I'm literally no better or worse than anybody else. I've just decided to replicate people that work at it at a higher level than I do. It's the same with any self-employed business, right? You can do it in an average kind of way just by doing it, but to be really efficient and good at it, you, you need continuous lessons from, from someone that you gel with, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, and also you just don't know the things that you don't know as well. Um, yeah. I've, I've quite famously put for, for three or four minute videos on my Facebook page every day since lockdown. And uh, they're now getting sort of 45, 50,000 hits a week. And just the little two cent things that you encounter in the property market when you're making multiple offers every day that you know are, are a fact and this works and then this is a real world solution that other people just go, wow, never knew that. Would have never come across that in my entire life. Um, it just makes a big difference. Yeah. Hey, cool. Anything you want to say to budding investors out there? We'll just kind of we'll wrap it up after that. But just sort of what, what's your sort of message to people if they approach you and say, hey, what do you what do you think at the moment? Um, I'll just tell them what I think at the moment, to be fair. Um, it, it's a it's a it's a changing market, but it always is. Um, 
the, the screaming hot marketplace that we're encountering now and that we, we have to handle at this moment will not be like this forever. Um, the only constant is change. Um, if a bank says no to you for funding, go and talk to a broker. If the broker says no, go and talk to a, another bank or a second tier lender or don't just don't take no for an answer. Um, people can do joint ventures. People could do long settlement terms. People can bird dog other deals for other investors for a finder's fee until they've got capital together. I mean, you know, another reason I don't think that every, everybody needs a property coach is because you just need a burning desire. And if you have a burning desire, you'll find the thing that fixes it for you. Um, yep. so, so stay hungry, keep at it. It's out there. There's plenty of money to be made. There's no shortage of property and there's no shortage of people who want to own it and rent it. Mm. Brilliant. Hey, if someone wants to get hold of you and just talk about property coaching, how do they get up on my Facebook page, Steve Goody property coach, and just send me a message through messenger from there. That'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. And watch those videos. Cause, uh, I, yeah, I, yeah. I've been in the game a long time myself and, and I still learn a heap of stuff from, from your videos. So really worthwhile. Yeah. So brilliant. Hey, thanks, Steve. I really enjoyed that. And, uh, and thanks for dialing in. Thanks very much. I really enjoyed being here. Cheers.